You! Yeah, the wide-eyed one that clicked on this extremely specific YouTube link. Were you, by perchance, expecting someone? A voice? A half-edited montage? Maybe some gameplay while I mindlessly drone on in the foreground about stuff that's barely relevant to the title of the video until the very last five minutes, so that you'll have to stay and watch the whole thing in sheer boredom while regretting the fact that you clicked on this in the first place? <laughs> no. God, no, what kind of fool do you take me for? Ah, oh, jeez. Let's just spring into it. Yeah. Hi. Welcome to what will hopefully be a whole series where I go digging into the various items, mechanics, gimmicks, and objects important to the Sonic series. Because I have nothing better to do. <clears throat> you stink! So picture this. 1991. You're sitting there, a few meters away from your big old CRT television, and you've got on your hands on a fresh Genesis, or as we call it, Mega Drive, copy of Sonic the Hedgehog. Clean and in perfect working order out of the box, you didn't have to blow on it, and it's specifically not for resale for some reason. That, um, that part isn't important. What is important, however, is that this is your first time. You're getting used to everything the game's immediately throwing at your tiny little brain. The controls, the graphics, the flow and the feel, the speed of the game, the brilliant music from that band you never heard of till dreams come true, the rings, the badniks, the physics, the inductory level design... <laughs> Jesus Christ, that's a lot! The one saving grace here is that you're getting it little by little. You're going right as the level layout's been describing to you so far. You're getting the idea of what Sonic can do by pushing buttons to jump. But then, all of a sudden, you see it. A weird, yellow, flat-looking thing. You probably don't know what it does, what it is, or how it works from this two-dimensional view. Maybe it's one of Eggman's contraptions if you had to guess? Conniving asshole. You probably won't see him for another two X, but he's there in the back. Probably laughing his head off at how dumb you are. Asshole. The worst part about this here? You can see more of the level off to your right from where you stand, and it's probably got something really cool waiting for you if that tease of a ring is anything to go by. But you won't know until you try. So, you try toying with it. It doesn't seem to hurt you when you touch it, so it definitely isn't dangerous. You can't move it as much as you make Sonic try to, and you can always jump over it at the risk of dying. There's a drop, and you've got no idea where you'll land until you try falling, but that's probably best safe for another playthrough. So there's one thing left that you can try. You jump on it, and then the sound plays. All of a sudden, you're jumping way higher than you ever would have dreamt of with Sonic. You've only known this game for about a minute or so, less even, and suddenly you're going pretty goddamn high. You can touch the skies, everything is in your reach. But then, while you're in the air, you push right like the game dictates you do, and suddenly, you've crossed that gap. The game gave you an invisible bridge, you took it, and now it's rewarding you for it with some rings. Good job on being brave. He's a rock. Wait, what? This begins the start of a beautiful relationship with a spring. One of the most important cruxes of a Sonic game. Your best friend, eventually your annoying enemy, but an all-around good guy that only wants to help you along a path set out for you to take. The road for how Sonic levels feel to play just got a lot more fun. And this is just the beginning. The best is yet to come and then it just keeps on coming. Suddenly you find these yellow fellas hiding in trees to reward you with clusters of rings or giving you a leg up when you see someone you want. But hell, that's just half of what Sonic 1 can show you with springs. Less than half, even. It's got a big brother, it's red, and it hits hard. You're no longer touching the skies, you're in space, and you can clear gaps like nobody's business. The difference in color here dictates the strength if you haven't noticed, easily telling you what each one does. But it's also with this where some of the downside of springs come into play. You might have noticed that you're not in a ball when going up or going down, meaning you're in a vulnerable state. And if you got hit before, then you know what that should mean. Watch where you land. Later on, only triple trouble on Game Gear had allowed you to hit your jump button to swap into a ball state at the time, so you could actually write yourself before you came falling down. Probably meant for accounting for the screen size, but it's utilized well since there are times which require it. So now, you know about going up, but wait, there's more. Let's flash back to 1990 real quick. Hey, uh, what's that you're working on? I want Sonic to go faster here, but we don't have anything to work with in this, like, little area. Really? I mean, we got these things, and they worked well enough to send Sonic backward a bit in Green Hill Zone. Hold on here. Let me try something. 
and we just do this and that. Oh, oh my god. god. By changing the rotation of the spring, the versatility of this as a game mechanic multiplies. Fourfold. It goes from being a way to bridge the level together to something that immediately speeds you up and urges you to go faster. Something that gets reinvented into a more fitting object later. But what if you put it in the opposite facing ways aside from up or right? Well, you put a spring pointing down at the roof of a cabin you're heading towards, and you craftily start to condition the player into sharpening their reaction times, intending for them to break away from repetitive headbutts. As for making it face the other way you're going, well, I'm sure me standing outside your house with a metal bat is enough to keep you from moving forward. Not only do these things help, but they also hinder. They hinder but good. Let's fast forward a year to Sonic 2. You're playing in Hilltop Zone Act 2, having fun, and then uh, the most devious of spring traps, and you fell right into it. This right here is the bane of Sonic's goddamned existence, and I hope you're happy you put him there. These two springs act as the state of perpetuity, and it does not stop until you jump out of there. Hopefully you didn't waste all your 10 minutes doing so. It's things like these that show you some springs, not all of them, would like to do a little trolling. You too can make traps like these in your own fan games or projects, but you can also go one step further. What's that? Eggman's attached them to badniks. Looks like you've got to develop a new attack strategy. You're telling me, some decades later, Eggman figures out how to make fake springs to bring you to certain death? Better watch out for those, huh? Someone made a spinning spike ball slash spring contraption where you've got to time your jump dash to progress? Clock's ticking, little dude. Yeah, that does make him sound pretty annoying, honestly, but hey, 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 wait, wait! Springs can do other things too, I swear! They aid in something you might have heard of. An automatic section. In brief, auto-sections are how you can make in-game cinematics interactive, to a degree. With the inclusion of springs, you can set up a whole row of them and they'll make up for the loss of control with the visual aid of spectacle. That's, um, that's not really good reason, but they've stuck with the game since it's virtual one, so... Damned if you do, damned if you don't. The way to add a bit of interactivity to it, however, is to turn the springs into a quick time event, which was also in the same game to start with. And, um, check this out. Yeah, this blew me away the first time I saw this too. Springs can have strength. All the difference a button makes to give something interactivity, huh? This could have paved the way for more interesting spring routes and games, but all we got were the gimmick aspects. A decent trade-off, but not the best. These things are the lifeblood of Sonic games. In fact, I've yet to find a game that does not have some kind of form of this. You can fact check me in the comments on that one. Thanks to their execution from as early as Sonic 1, they paved the way for dash panels, jump panels, jump panels, bumpers, air rings and rainbow rings, badniks with spring-based properties, the spring pogo and Sonic Chaos, the wide springs, propeller springs, the little trick springs with the phases on them and go, when you hit one, the spring poles that stick out of the walls, springs that take you to the special stages, springs that- Bounce pad! Okay, that's enough. Let's close this out. How exactly should we use springs? Well, we should go over what we covered. Of course, they aren't the only objects in Sonic games that do this, but they were the first. They're invisible bridges to get you from A to B where your feet can't. So you put them at the walls, the edges, places with gaps. You let them inspire you to try and create new objects out of what it could initially do at first, whether it be for speed, for challenging someone, or just for pure visual fidelity. You can chain them together to make a special little route for the player, whether it be done through homing attacks or just plain automation. More often than not, you just let it take you to where you want to go. And I think that is what helps make the game much more dynamic. Thank you so much for watching. This is my first time trying anything like this aside from that video I made from um, fan games some time ago and um, I'm pretty sure my style's a bit all over the place, script-wise. Sorry if that came through on your end. Maybe it'll pad out as I keep this going. I want to turn this into a full series, get off the ground properly and build a platform for this sort of discussion, you know? But I'm not going to be able to completely commit to that without your help. If you can offer it, of course. Check this video here for how you can help, and here's something else you can watch if you'd rather not. In the meantime, I hope to see you again soon, and hold out.